right. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, thank you to the Drupal GovCon team for inviting me to speak. Thank you all for being here. I understand you're missing a dance off to be here, so thank you for that. Um, I'm That's excited. Exactly why I'm here. Yes, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is my first Drupal GovCon, so I've been very uh, excited and happy to be here, learning a lot and seeing a lot of new things. Um, so I'm going to speak today about documentation for developers. I've been thinking lately about when I first started my career several years ago and developers on my team who are just starting their careers now. And I've just been kind of reflecting a bit on how there's a lot to learn and a lot of different aspects and how documentation has kind of played a role in my growth since then. So I started in 2015 as a developer, uh, back when Drupal 7 was the current version. I had done some previous freelance WordPress experience before that, and I remember as I was getting started, a coworker kind of showing me this graph that might be familiar to some of you, uh, showing the learning curve for popular CMS platforms, and that Drupal can be a little bit treacherous, especially as getting started. You know, there's a lot to learn and a lot of different things that are, are unfamiliar uh, for someone like me who had a bit of WordPress experience but was new to Drupal. And so I started learning about various Drupal technologies, you know, things like content types with nodes and fields, user roles and permissions, modules, views, all those good things. And then I was learning a lot about front-end best practices, things like CSS preprocessors, semantic HTML, accessibility, atomic design, and version control. And this being my first real professional job as a consultant at an agency, I was also learning and keeping in mind things like customer service, managing tasks against multiple projects, understanding and following project requirements, and of course, fighting against scope creep while dealing with trying to maintain some semblance of a work-life balance. And when you put all those things together at once, it can feel a little bit like you're in a boat fighting against a tidal wave. Needless to say, there's a lot to learn. And I quickly kind of felt overwhelmed and can understand that new developers would feel overwhelmed with all that information just coming in their way as a new developer. And so the tendency that I felt and that I found was to really dig deep into code and kind of trying to become a better developer by getting my hands on the keyboard and you know really digging in that way, um, but realize that there were other ways I could become a more effective team member as well. So I work at Gravity Works Design and Development. We are a remote company uh, of about 15 years now uh, and about 25 people. Uh, headquartered in Lansing, Michigan, where I'm from, um, but we have people all across eight or nine different states now. Um, we are focused on websites and mobile apps, primarily in Drupal, but we do some other work as well. Um, one thing that I've always liked about Gravity Works and why I've kind of stuck around is um, I've been here for the past nine years now. And one thing I like is that we hire from a lot of different backgrounds. You know, it's not just computer science grads, we also have people with all sorts of different backgrounds. So I, for example, have an arts and humanities degree and a French minor and jazz trombone performance, all things that, you know, lead really easily into web development. Um, and then we've had other team members on our team who have been teachers in the past, who have been in customer support, uh, HR, things like that where it's not exactly a traditional path into, into web development, but you see a lot of those benefits and a lot of advantages that those people with those different backgrounds bring into tech. And so one other thing that I kind of picked up as part of my college curriculum and just my general interest was an interest in writing. Uh, so while I was at college at Michigan State, go green, uh, my first job was at the Writing Center on campus. Uh, so I was both their website coordinator, doing, doing some WordPress work, but then also a writing consultant. So I would work with students who would bring their writing in and work to kind of help them become better writers and work through their writing as, uh, assignments and issues. I also, while I was trying to figure out what I was doing with my life after graduation, did some freelance, uh, freelance work, some web development, but also ended up doing some music writing, including for Billboard. Uh, so this is an example article that I wrote analyzing some data for special guests on a Taylor Swift tour and how their music sales increased after that. And so coming into Gravity Works as a web developer, I brought those writing and communication skills with me and came to the realization that using those writing skills and documentation could help me in the moment on projects as I was working through things. It could help future Kurt when doing support work, or referring back to that work uh, when I needed to review it later. But it would also help the rest of my team. And since then, um, I've had the privilege of helping to hire 18 different front-end developers who've joined our team over the years, uh, several of whom, like me, started their development careers at Gravity Works. And so I really try to make it part of my responsibility to keep documentation as an important part of our team culture. 
So as we go through the session today, um, I'm gonna walk through a few different sections here, almost as if we work through the life cycle of a project from start to finish. Um, so first, we'll kind of talk through this play, uh, preparing and planning stage in the early stages of a project before you're really getting much into code, um, but just doing a lot of discovery work and planning. And then we'll manage what I call the messy middle, you know, the part of the project where you're getting busy in the work and changing requirements and all that good stuff. Um, and then unlocking future potential using your documentation. And then we'll close by talking a little bit about the word efficient um, and how maybe effectiveness is a bit of a better goal and how documentation can aid in that process. So I wanna start with a slight little exercise here. Um, take a few seconds to just review this 10 digit number and without writing it down, try to commit it to memory. Um, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes here. One of the key points I want to make is that your memory is an unreliable narrator. So my work as a consultant means I'm often juggling and prioritizing multiple different projects on any given day. And I think the tendency that we find is when we're trying to move quickly and you know do more with less, we tend to avoid practices like documentation. We just assume, well, we'll remember it all and we'll, when we need it, we'll get back to it. We'll have it in our head. That's great. And I've often found from experience that that's not the case. Um, so documentation really helps to offload that need to remember that and keep it in your mind, which then keeps your mind productive and focused on those harder problems that your brain really should be focused on. And that's what your clients want from you too, right? Um, and so in our next few slides, we'll show some, show some considerations to document in the early planning stages of a new project. So starting off with component planning. Uh, we, as many of you may as well, build with component-based design in mind. Um, so our developers will work alongside our designers and our UX team uh, to break down components and build in, in, in a component library tool such as Storybook. Um, so with Atomic Design, you kind of break down your mock-up into smaller pieces like atoms and molecules and organisms. And so we'll try to document our components in the same way, um, noting things like variants, adding screenshots, descriptions as needed. And so this image on the right here is just showing a few examples of atoms and molecules that we have on a project. And we'll include some names in here and some variants if we need to. Um, sometimes what we try to do is make our names memorable. So you know, you think of things like a hero image, but we'll also throw in something called a sidekick sometimes. Um, things that will kind of build a shared language across our teams when our designers and our developers and even our client stakeholders are talking about the project and, and the progress on it. And We'll talk in a little bit about how naming things is maybe hard, um, but remembering those unique names that you've named something can be harder if you don't also include context on what that name corresponds with. And so in a spreadsheet like this, we'll try to include descriptions that say, okay, this is what a sidekick is used for, um, so that you kind of build that shared language and understanding. Um, we'll do the same thing with co documenting content structures in a CMS. Like I mentioned, we mostly do this in Drupal, but all of this kind of would be an exact parallel into WordPress or other development as well. Um, we have been using Notion for this. We've more recently moved into a Google Sheets template. Um, and ours is maybe slightly different, but really the picture here is of Acquia's Drupal spec tool, which is really similar to that idea. And it breaks down essentially your content model, your structures into fields, view modes, image styles, and all that good stuff that we need to build things out. And really what that early planning does is it means we're thinking through that content model early on, we're considering how different content types and other structures will interact with and connect to one another, and that we're getting that thinking happening really early in the phase of the project. Um, we often like to plan development tasks when we can beforehand as well. You know, that really helps to get our thoughts in motion early on, and it allows them to also kind of gestate as we're moving into other parts of the project. We'll have those other things in the back of our mind and be able to continue to iterate on those ideas. One tip that I really like to give my team is to um, make sure your titles are actionable. Um, and one way to do that is starting with a verb like create or build or add. And there have been a couple examples that I've realized that my titling of a task isn't as great. So for example, I've seen one before that says footer background is blue. And this is more like the QA phase at this point. But if I see the task footer background is blue, does that title indicate a request to change to what the mockup requires? Or is it a notice that it's blue on the site and we need to change it to match the mockup? And so that's just extra work that your brain is doing that ideally it wouldn't have to. 
Um, another example I had recently, check whether editors can access web form submissions. And then my question is, are they supposed to be able to access them or not? And so you kind of have to dig into the task a little further before you know what your next steps are. And if we can do that right in the title, then we're ready to go right there. So really your task should identify a problem, whether that's a business rule or a QA issue that needs to be resolved. And then the title kind of indicates the solution to that problem. So in this case, the example I mentioned, allow editors to manually reorder the resources list. Um, in those tasks, we use Asana for this, but any other task management system would do. Um, those, uh, we include descriptions, screenshots, any acceptance criteria that you would need, um, just to provide that additional context and information where it's needed um, if the title alone doesn't do it. And another thing to remember is that those tasks don't need to be set in stone. You know, if requirements change or your plans change a bit, you can rename tasks, update descriptions, all that good stuff before the task is complete if necessary. So here's just a little screenshot of our Asana system where we've got a high-level overview of several tasks on a project. Um, all of them have action-based titles, and they would have descriptions as you dig in where appropriate. So documentation is the act of thinking and then putting those thoughts on paper. Um, when documenting while doing early planning, you're allowing yourself to be proactive instead of reactive, and you're anticipating issues while they're more manageable and not urgent also. One thing I've seen over the years that's been a bit of a problem is that if you don't plan ahead and you don't write things down, you will just kind of lose track of your plans and the, the project needs by the time the quality assurance phase begins, and then by the time that rolls around, um, you're dealing with more issues than you would be in a QA phase that often has plenty to do anyway when you've got multiple different stakeholders reviewing the site, you've got design QA, accessibility things you want to double check. You don't want to also be figuring out plans that you had already made and then forgot. And another thought that I, I try to express to my team is that it doesn't have to be a huge foreboding responsibility. I think sometimes people think documentation is this big tome of information that they have to write. And I have done that before. I've, I have one example where I wrote 12,000 words out about feature documentation on one project because it was complicated and I was handing it off to a, a client team member. Um, but other things, small things uh, count too. Comments, commit messages, status updates, all those things I consider documentation as well and think they're just as important to the process. And as I said, you're putting those thoughts on paper and you're relieving your mind of the responsibility to hold on to those thoughts so then your mind can spend more time thinking about problem solving and innovation. What it also I found is helpful, and I see this happen when people will report back all the time in our team, that it frees up your mind so that you can have ideas and problem solve when you're doing other things. You know, when you're walking the dog, you're having shower thoughts, you're, you go to sleep on an issue and you wake up and you've got a problem solved right there. Um, because your mind is just free to think through those things. Um, that's something I definitely have had happen numerous times myself as well. And so one thing I've pulled from a little bit is personal knowledge management books. I've read a few of those lately, and I thought this quote was relevant uh, from David Allen's Getting Things Done. Um, he says, even if you've already decided on the next step you'll take to resolve a problem, your mind can't let go until and unless you park a reminder in a place it knows you will without fail look. It will keep pressuring you about that untaken next step, usually when you can't do anything about it, which will just add to your stress. So we will talk more a little bit about use cases for that documentation in our next section, which is what I like to call the messy middle. So the messy middle is a part of the project where developers are doing work according to requirements, they're getting things done, and those requirements inevitably change somewhat as things come together, clients start to see a working website and really start to think through the possibilities a little bit more. And I found that documentation practices can help keep your scope clear, they keep your plans in motion, and then they inevitably, as a result, keep your stress lower as well. Um, so talk a little bit about Miller's Law. Miller's Law comes up in user experience and psychology, and he states that the immediate memory span of people is limited to approximately seven items, plus or minus two. He does stress that the magical number seven, as he puts it, isn't a hard and fast rule, um, but it's an average, give or take a couple, that he saw pretty often in his studies. And I think what this shows in terms of our documentation discussion is that this uh, trying to keep a lot of information in your memory is likely to fail because your memory span just can't hold on to everything, no matter how hard you might try. Speaking of that, no need to shout it out, but think, uh, think back on those 10 numbers I showed you a few minutes ago. We've introduced several different new things and topics since then, and just think to yourself if you remember those numbers. 
Miller's Law might suggest that you don't because there were just too many things that you've learned since then that you've kept in your memory. Here's some numbers. I think I heard it. Yep. So what if I had presented those numbers to you in this format? This is a phone number, and it is Gravity versus Phone Number. Go to the website. Go to the phone. <laughs> oh. But this practice of breaking it down into pieces like this, this is called chunking, and these chunks are easier to digest. Um, and I think that's often why phone numbers are presented in that way. And Miller even says that the size of the bits of information are not so much of the problem as just the number of different bits that you have to remember. So remembering three chunks here is easier than a whole ten digit thing. And so that practice of chunking can be used when documenting as well, whether that's tasks or meeting notes. Um, you want your tasks and your notes to be in small, easily digestible chunks. Just like you wouldn't want to read hundreds of words written on these slides, you wouldn't want to read a whole book all at once instead of broken into chapters, you wouldn't want to look at a large task that doesn't give you a good path to start from. And one thing I found as well um, that's really helped me is that ha when I have my tasks documented in those small chunks, I can jump into a project and immediately be productive even when I just have a few spare minutes. Like if I have a few extra minutes between meetings where it's too long for just a break but um, gives me a little bit of time to do some work, um, I can still jump into a small task and be productive on that, whereas I didn't have to spend time getting into a big task and figuring out where I need to go next. That also lowers your cognitive overhead, which is always good, because that means you're focused on the work, not figuring out what work you need to do. I also find that when we're working in cross-functional teams with project managers and user experience members, um, that I can more quickly turn a task around for review because those tasks are smaller to test, and it also helps if I need to reassign or delegate that work to another developer because they have a very small set of information that they need in order to get into that task. So really what we're trying to do is avoid this draw the owl meme here where you go from step A to step B and there's a lot to do in between those steps um, and you just can't figure out the, the small next steps and you end up kind of overwhelmed and unsure where to go. So that owl image is kind of an example of what is called the fog of uncertainty. And so by chunking and through other preparation, we can avoid having similar issues when we start development. Um, in the same way as what we talked about, you don't want to look at a mock-up and not have a good idea of how to go in and get started with the development phase. And uncertainty will drive procrastination, it will decrease productivity, all things that are not great for kind of being a productive and effective developer. And note in this picture too, the rocky path and the uneven hill, I think that's a good parallel to a typical project. I mean, your projects will have enough known unknowns and unknown unknowns that we don't need to add to those by not having a clear, well-documented plan as we're getting started. So in our next few slides, we'll talk a little bit about documentation strategies in code, in project details, and in meeting notes. And one important tip that I learned back when I was at the Writing Center at MSU as a writing consultant, um, but now as a web development consultant as well, was to know who your audience is. Who are you writing for? Are you writing for fellow developers? Are you writing for coworkers in other roles? Uh, client team members, and really adjust your approach and your communication accordingly. Another thing is to document where the right people are going to see it. So your project manager doesn't need to see your code comments, so don't put those into a task management <laughs> system. But on the other hand, don't put information that's relevant to project managers in your code comments and expect them to go in and look at those. So just knowing where your audience is and who that audience is. I think that also includes yourself, though, too. Um, so you want to document where you'll be able to find that later as you continue your development or as you know you or another developer is supporting the project after it's originally launched. Another thing too is that search is your friend. So if you're able to use search tools to surface that documentation, that's always helpful as well. Um, one note I would make is to uh, avoid using words like just and simply in your documentation that kind of assume, assume a level of understanding that may or may not be there. And when we talk about cognitive load, that's an example of where you can increase that cognitive load for your reader, which could be you yourself, um, if something unexpected happens. You know, if a uh, fire comes in from a client and you need to solve a problem and you get into documentation that says, just do this, and you do it and it doesn't work, um, then you're kind of already frantically dealing with a problem and now that's made that even worse because your documentation is assuming that you were able to figure something out and you couldn't. And in the documentation too, if it makes sense, include visuals, external links, things like that, uh, screenshots of settings pages, external links that have more in-depth info, just things that provide some additional context and wayfinding to your reader. 
What about documenting code with comments? So code is strict, but writing is not. You can be more descriptive and introduce more prose in your writing where you have to be careful not to introduce bugs in your code. Um, and I've seen an argument that your code should describe itself. You shouldn't need comments because comments and code are just noise, um, especially if they were to get outdated. And what I've learned is that that doesn't often account for things like business logic from a client, where you might introduce things that need that little bit of additional context in order to be clearly understood in the code. I also like, too, when I can put comments and documentation that help teach those who might be looking at the code later and are less familiar with it um, what those complex parts are. Or if it's something that you know I'm doing for the first time and I might come back to this three months later and not know how I figured that out in the first place. Another example um, are magic numbers. So those are specific numbers that don't have an obvious reason for being used. I think it's always helpful to have comments in there that just explain what they're for and why they're there. And when I write new code, new functions, and things like that, I will try to write out the steps that I need to take as comments before I start writing the code, and then fill in the necessary code below each step. Uh, so for example, let's say I'm pre-processing a node, I might write comments that I'm checking the node's content type, I'm checking if a specific field is not empty, and then I'm assigning its value to a variable that I can pass into a twig template. I now have that uh, code written out, but I also have documentation right there and done for me because I had to go through that thought process to be in there. So one other example I have too is that one time I was on a phone with a client who I work with regularly dealing with an urgent issue related to backend code where I as a front end developer wasn't familiar with it and the backend developer wasn't uh, in the office that day. And I get into the code while I'm on the phone with the client, it's 500 lines, no comments. That is really something you want to avoid um, because I had to spend that time figuring all that out. One other thing I'll do with comments is that if I pull a snippet or an idea from something like Stack Overflow or a comment in a Drupal.org issue, um, I will try to include a link to that idea in the comment. Um, and that just leaves a breadcrumb that points me back to my earlier thinking if I need that. That's the Drupal song. <laughs> Getting tears. <laughs> 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 so I found over the years there are a few ways that I approach documentation that have actually parallels to development practices as well, which is kind of neat. Um, so for example, you might write an early return in a function if you get an irrelevant input, and in the same way you can write an escape patch in your documentation that tells someone to stop reading if the rest of the document isn't relevant to them. So one example of that is that we have tasks in our Asana template uh, about processes that we take when we're about to take a site live on Pantheon. And if the client is hosting a site themselves, we don't really need to do anything with that task. And so if we call that out early on in the task description, somebody reading that to figure out what they need to do sees right away that, well, they don't need to do anything and they can just mark that task complete. Um, also found that task and document templates, things like weekly meeting notes, uh, make it easier to repeat those same processes just like a repeatable function would. And then as I mentioned previously, you get closer to the idea of documentation-driven development if you write your comments as you plan your code, because as you finish your code, your documentation is done as well. So something we say a lot and have conversations about at Gravity Works is that naming things is hard, but I've started to see some interesting sentiment lately that you know, maybe it doesn't have to be. I think the key takeaway is to be clear, not clever, when you're naming things. And speaking about action-based uh, variables and titles, uh, action-based variables, things like get roles, save token, prepare data, things that start with verbs are helpful to do that. I'm doing the same thing with functions that identify state, you know, is open instead of check if open, or something like has profile picture. And what that also does, which is kind of nice, is that it helps you keep the mindset of having small functions that perform one action, which is a good best practice unrelated to documentation, it's just a good development best practice, um, because now your function is named after what it does, and if you're adding to that function, you might realize, well, this isn't exactly in line with the name of this function, that's a good sign to move it into a different one. So I'll speak a little bit about architecture decision records. Hopefully everybody was able to catch uh, Andrew's talk on this yesterday, actually. Um, I caught a version of it uh, at DrupalCon Europe last year, um, and we had been talking about it at Gravity Works around the same time. And he said that uh, these are decisions that you make on a project, and they can also document invisible standards, which are things you, know, you do by default that aren't written down. And you can include context about why the decision was made, the details and consequences of that action, 
And those, those decisions are meant to kind of exist for the longer term, but they don't necessarily have to exist forever. You can supersede those new decisions because things will change you know, as technology evolves, as business will evolve. Um, and what was interesting about that, that talk that Andrew Berry, who's the director of technology at Lullabot, um, had a good talk last year about it. And theirs at Lullabot are a bit more org wide from what I could tell in that talk, um, which we're talking about kind of taking it in that route as well. We are approaching them and still getting into a bit of experimentation phase with it, but um, we are doing them more on a project level, whereas we're in the client meeting and understanding project decisions, we'll start to solidify those into architecture decision records. Um, and what we find with those is that that is a form of documentation that helps you defend the decisions you're making as you develop, and they also help you remember why you did what you did in the future. We've had that happen before where we'll come back into a project and say, you know, why did we build it this way? And if we have a nice record of that, we have the exact answer that we need. So how about in meetings? I want to stress that documentation is everyone's responsibility, even developers, during meetings. Um, I think it's important to note that our responsibility as developers is to understand a client's goals and needs and ensure that our work is going to meet those needs. In our notes, I say uh, to avoid transcribing the full conversation. We'll talk in a little bit about how AI tools can help with that. Uh, but do note important information, decisions that are made during the meeting, and any next steps that you need to take. Um, again, take advantage of document templates and prep your agenda notes in those, in those doc templates beforehand, so that way you're ready to focus on the meeting when the time comes, instead of having to write down what you need to be asking. Um, one tip I have too, if you can see the star uh, in this screenshot here, I like to use emojis to highlight a action items during a meeting. And so that way when the meeting is over and I'm double checking what my next steps are, I can easily see that this was something I called out that I, I need to take action as a result of that meeting. Another kind of similar note there is to make sure you write down next steps that get decided on during the meeting. Um, I've had this happen before and learned this lesson that if a conversation topic wraps up and the next steps aren't clear, you won't move forward successfully. So make sure you get clarity and then put it in writing so that you hold on to it and don't have to keep thinking about it. Uh, lastly, I found this process very useful. This is something I call checking out, you know, like at, your, at a grocery store and checking out. Um, so I'm a team lead who splits my time between coding, attending meetings, and managing others on my team. And so I need to be able to jump into my individual work without wasting a lot of time and energy figuring out where I last left off. And so what I'll try to do is before I switch projects, like I'm getting ready to start a meeting, um, before I end my day, or especially before if I'm going to Drupal GovCon or a vacation, um, I will make sure I leave a comment that notes where I left off and what I think I need to do next. And again, it's just an idea of giving myself a breadcrumb that leads me back to my previous spots when I need to get back into it. And in that, you're reducing friction, just like you would if you were you know, building a habit of getting ready to go to the gym every morning, and you're building a habit by uh, leaving your gym clothes out the night before so that they're right there and ready for you. It's the same way that you're reducing friction here. The kind of added benefit of that is not only does it help me spin back up more easily, but it also helps keep the rest of my team informed of my progress. Um, so my project manager or another manager can see those comments and not really need to check in with me. I think that's important for myself and my team, uh, where I'm a manager who doesn't want to feel like I'm micromanaging my team members, and if I can see their comments and their progress just through their comments alone in a task, then I don't need to interrupt them. They can kind of stay focused on what they were doing, and I don't feel like I'm micromanaging. So psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi Mihai said in his well-known book, Flow, uh, retrieving information from memory storage and bringing it into the focus of awareness, comparing information, evaluating, deciding, all make demands in the mind's limited processing capacity. So all those practices that we talked about are really meant to encourage flow, which is the ability for a developer to sit down and focus on their work without friction or confusion. And I really think that's key to productivity and making progress. So documentation remains a hugely important practice even after a project is finished, and that's perhaps where its usefulness even increases as you reference it while maintaining the project or reusing parts of that on new work. So I'm sure AI is on everybody's mind. We've heard plenty about it and we'll hear plenty more this week. Um, I have been proceeding with caution somewhat with AI tools. Um, I try to use it to speed up some workflows, but still making sure that I keep the human element in place to review its output. Uh, but one nice thing is that documentation can help power those AI tools uh, but it's hard to do that if you don't have that information in written form. Uh, so a couple tools I've been using, uh, Google recently launched one called Notebook LM, 
and then AI services from apps we already use, like Notion. Um, those kind of tools can help surface new insights from your docs and provide quick access information. So you may see in these screenshots here on the left, I've used it to aggregate some information using Notebook LM from books and articles whose highlights I've saved. Um, and then in this example, I'm looking through a documentation that I wrote to get some information in Notion AI, uh, just quickly sifting through information and getting those answers. I mentioned earlier to avoid transcribing meetings if you can, and that's because many AI services can do that for you. Uh, so at GravityWorks, our project managers will often use a tool like Fireflies to record, transcribe, and summarize many meetings. Uh, and I know others have tried tools like Otter and Rewind as well. Uh, the tool in the bottom left here is called Super Whisper, and that's one of the few examples uh, of a text-to-speech app. And that will help somebody who's a verbal processor really produce a written record so they can still you know, have all the verbal thoughts that they need to, but then they get a rec written record that they can have for future reference as well. One caveat, of course, that I should make, please ask for consent before recording others. And one major component of documenting and learning from documentation is the practice of sharing what you know. And so truly, I say documentation is a team sport. It should be everyone's responsibility, and everyone can benefit from it. You learn when you write documentation because you have to understand it, or at least have some level of understanding in order to produce documentation that others can understand. But then others grow from what you've shared and build upon it and you know, remix those ideas, and together you're building collective knowledge. And one thing I try to encourage my team members too, who are kind of hesitant to get in and write documentation, is that you don't have to know everything in order to help someone learn. You just have to know something that they don't and then be willing to share it with them. So documentation is a great way to do that. We hear about shifting left a lot when it comes to things like testing and security, you know, making sure they're acknowledged and considered earlier in the process. We heard a little bit about shifting left with that information gap yesterday in the keynote. Um, we'll do that with accessibility a lot as well, ensuring that we talk about plain language when we craft our content, make sure that we're considering accessibility and designs. And lately I've been thinking, why not take this approach to documentation as well and ensure that we bring it into the process as early as we can and as often as we can. So one more book quote, this one is interesting, I was kind of surprised to see this, almost a hot take from Dan Mall, who is a design systems practitioner with a large design background, but also a bit of a development background as well. Um, and in his book, uh, Design That Scales, he pointed out, somewhat in the defense of the front-end developer, he said, who on the team actually makes work in software? Only the engineers. Every other role is largely one of documentation. And it felt a bit like a hot take, but he did kind of back that up by saying whether it's you know IA diagrams, product requirements, strategy, brief, strategy briefs, task descriptions, or design comps, all those things are different types of documentation that really help us to build software. And so it's good to really build that into your developer's culture, but then also to spread that off to the rest of the team as well, so that you're all writing various forms of documentation that you're all helping one another build and grow. So a few strategies that will help you build that collective knowledge within a team. First is to write as you learn. So get your decisions, your thoughts, your discoveries on paper early while they're still fresh in your head. Um, documenting in your own words also helps with memory retention. And others may read those notes early on and help you refine those ideas as well. Second is rubber ducking, which is you know articulating a problem and writing your speech. As if you've got a rubber duck in your hand and you're kind of thinking out loud to it. And I often recommend to my team that if you're working through a problem, you get stuck, um, and you get stuck for more than 15 minutes, that's kind of where it's time to ask for help. And what I have found and what they have found is that often that process of saying, okay, I'm asking for help, I'm gonna write out my question in Slack where we generally do our work, often that process of writing out the problem uh, causes them to think through the full issue from the beginning, and then they figure it out on their own before they finished writing, um, and then they're all set. Third is to work in public. Uh, so we aren't fully reinventing the wheel with every Drupal site that we build. Um, and we also will have several different niches that we have, so things that one person may share may help somebody else in the near future as well. Often it does. And so I really encourage my team to ask questions and share info in public Slack channels rather than direct messaging uh, and in private group channels. And another thing too with the idea of rubber ducking is that even if they learn the answer to their own question, they can respond to themselves in a Slack thread and now they have that record of the thought process, the question and the answer that they or others can follow later. Another one that I heard about recently that I'm liking is this idea of answering questions with a link. So this is really a good way to build up a repository of documents. Um, and so if somebody asks a question and you can't find a link that answers that question, 
uh, for example, in your like internal knowledge database, um, consider writing that document instead of just directly answering the question to them, but then share that link to them. Uh, and then that way, you and they have a link in your knowledge base that you can refer back to the next time somebody asks that question. So it just helps kind of build that practice of building up a repository. So with collective knowledge, you and your team are more easily able to collaborate and support one another. So for example, I went on vacation to Europe for about a week and a half at the end of last year. And uh, beforehand, I had a client that I generally work with who, when they have a server issue of a certain kind, I will usually deal with that for them. Um, but I made sure before I left that I had that process documented so that if and when it happened, um, another team member was able to go in and fix it while I was in an Uber on the way home, um, didn't need to get involved because he had the documentation and was able to get through and solve that problem. And that also helps to make sure that things continue to run smoothly when somebody is out sick, takes a mental health day, if they have an appointment they need to go to, if they need to pick up their children from school, all things that you know we just want to enable for our team members. I want to be building a team that that's, all those things are okay to do. And so by documentation practices and things like this, we can help support one another in that way. Lastly, I think it's important to note too that you build up resilience against employee turnover, whether that's due to things like the great resignation or layoffs. Um, because as they've worked, they've written things down, and now you have a record of their past thoughts and decisions that your other team members can refer back to. So in closing, I want to talk briefly about how many companies have recently pushed for efficiency and why effectiveness might be a better goal to aim for and how documentation is a part of that. So much has been said about how companies like Meta have referred to 2023 and now 2024 as well as the year of efficiency, especially with the rapid growth of AI. And that's led to layoffs, degradation and removal of features and services, and the general push to do more with less. And it's something I've been thinking a lot about lately and recently read some advice that resonated with me about how effectiveness might be more resilient than efficiency. So efficient teams are those that adopt the earlier mantra, also popularized by Zuckerberg and Meta, you know, move fast and break things. They value urgency over relevancy or importance, and that leads to instability, errors, and mistakes. If you compare that to an effective team, that they build with more purpose and intention, still quickly when they can, but more carefully. And they value tasks that are relevant over being urgent, and they avoid work that isn't important or useful. And I think really the key point here is that they understand the value of processes and practices like documentation that will help to establish stability for the team and its individuals. You know, if you think about if you're driving a car, you can be efficient by driving quickly, but you can be effective by making sure that you're driving in the right direction. And done right is better than done quickly. So really taking the time to document when you know it's going to help you and your team become more effective is a really great practice to adopt. When thinking about effectiveness in the age of AI, a key takeaway I have is that being effective means getting good at the thinking and problem solving that AI can't do for you, and documentation can help to speed up that process. I think it's great to take advantage of AI and other efficiencies when you can, uh, but it's no substitute for the practice of actually considering, thinking through, and writing down decisions and solutions, very much what was said in the keynote this afternoon. Um, you make yourself irreplaceable when you can use that documentation to plan and problem solve based on your past experience and your team knowledge. And so you may be questioning how you have the time to make documentation happen. I know, especially as a consultant, that we're often juggling multiple priorities and addressing issues quickly, and so sometimes it feels like there's just no time for that. And hopefully throughout the session, I've uh, shown that taking the time to build documentation into your team's culture helps that team thrive. You're able to remove silos and build collective knowledge. You also can do it little by little. Don't feel like you know the 12,000 words that I wrote is something you have to do all the time. Uh, planning documents, code comments, status updates, all those count as well. And if you see something that lacks documentation, gradually build it up, build it up with your team. Um, and so for example, with that 500 line example that I mentioned that there were no comments, as I was going through and figuring it out, I was writing out comments that said, okay, here's what these little lines do, and now I have that for the future. I actually just looked at it a couple weeks ago, and it was already there and documented for me. I didn't have to spend any time thinking through that again. And make it everyone's responsibility. Um, again, documentation is useful for everyone, and I really do think it belongs as part of an effective developer's role to help you, yourself, and your team. Lastly, tend to your garden. So documentation will grow stale over time if you're not careful. Um, so continually share those links out, review and revise your documentation, and allow that to extend its usefulness. Um, also, 
we use Notion for a lot of our documentation, so that's one example where you can allow for comments and edits uh, so that others can contribute and you don't become a blocker to fresh documentation that you wrote and have kind of let fall stagnant. Lastly, make documentation part of your definition of done. So build it into your processes, make it a habit on projects and tasks, and if you don't have the documentation that you need from someone else, encourage, if not help them, to write it. You know, we are all knowledge workers, and documentation is one way that we can help each other share and build that knowledge together. So with that, thank you for your time today, and thanks to our sponsors. Sure. So uh, we have a team where you've got, for instance, like a client, you then have a project manager, you then have a design team, you then have a development team, you then have an infrastructure team. Um, the client tells us, okay, we need a new button. And you talked about memory, how everybody remembers incorrectly. The project manager says it's supposed to be yellow, so their documentation in Microsoft Word says yellow. Um, the design team, they're in Figma, they say it's supposed to be orange. The, de the developers, they say that it's red. We then talk to the client, it's supposed to be blue. So the question is, um, the developers are putting their notes in code, uh, the project managers are putting it in JIRA, the business analyst is putting it in Word, the client's putting it on their own system externally. How do we bring all of that together so that we all know the button is blue, yep. and here's why. Yep, that's How a great, that? great question, and we talk a lot about sources of truth. I think at Gravity, or some see coworkers who are nodding here in the audience. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's a problem that is just tricky to solve. And I think one thing I think that is helpful is figuring out where that source of truth is. You know, is it the design? Is it somebody who has it in code? And ideally, you're all following the same initial thread, and those things are matching one another. Um, another thing too that I think we're looking into a lot are the way that different tools can kind of interface with one another. Um, so for example, if we've got Figma that's driving our designer's documentation, how can we pull from that into Storybook and have those two connect and talk to each other? So there's a VS Code extension, things like that, a Storybook uh, connection that can happen there. And so just really bringing those tools together where you can. But I do think it also is just a matter of communication too, of talking to your various teams and saying, you know, where is the source of truth? Where did we define that? And then how do we make sure that we all are on the same page? But it is a tricky, a tricky problem for sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so, if you're if you get put on a project that's not brand new, it's in existence, and then like it's poorly documented, mm -hmm. then it's uh, I guess you gotta try to start from inside and try to it's like out of order. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's always an interesting problem, and I think it's one that you know happens with things like turnover, where somebody leaves and you can't even ask them questions to get back on track. And so I think it's trying to figure out where you can find that information, if you can, and figuring out you know what questions do I have, what can I get answered. Ideally, yeah, you've gotten some of that information already documented and planned, um, but I think when it's not, yeah, it's also a communication thing going back to your team and saying, okay, this may be something that, and I, I will try to be unafraid too to say, you know, this may be something that you talked about already. I wasn't in the meeting. I don't see documentation on it. I want to make sure that I understand it, and then I can write it down to get the rest of the team to understand it moving forward as well. And so I think that that part of it comes in into effect as well, just kind of coming in and being a little bit vulnerable and saying, you know, this wasn't documented as well as it should have been before. Um, but how can we make sure we get this information and make this the last time that we do that? Thanks. So, um, one of the things that I kind of struggle with is like creating documentation, uh, you know, especially like a Drupal component, you know, only to find that, you know, if, especially if it's like documentation on a contrib module that other people have already done this documentation or having to link out. So what is your philosophy on that? Like if somebody has this documentation, how do you reference it? Do you replicate it on your end or do you link to it? Uh, what are some of the concerns? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, like the idea of kind of remixing it too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of things with like the Drupal, I, Drupal modules and things like that. The value of open source is there. I think so. You know, people are usually encouraging of those kind of additions and adjustments. And I think if we're all approaching it with the goal of we just want to make sure that everybody coming into it has the same base level understanding, I think that's really key to that. Is you know making sure that we all get on the same page. And I think. Really what I try to do with kind of internal documentation is making sure that somebody who 
has no knowledge of really the business rules and maybe is newer, not, maybe not necessarily entry level, but somebody who doesn't have a lot of that project background can really come in and be successful without having to you know, jump into a bunch of meetings and things. Because I think another thing that I find too with, um, with newer developers is they will feel really hesitant to ask those questions and get out and be vulnerable in that way because they assume that somebody should already, they should already know that answer. And so if I can try to approach my documentation in that way to say, you know, this, this, you're not expected to know this, here's what we can write out to get you the rest of the way, and then feel free to ask questions and refine the documentation from there. Thanks for the question. Thanks again, everybody.